Greetings, part fans, and welcome to another terrifyingly thrilling installment of Scary Stories Thursday. Once again, look at me, staying on track, we're doing it. And if you haven't been here before, every Thursday I just read a scary story off of creepypasta.com. And I've decided to change it up a little bit this week, so I'm going to be reading. And then if you stick around till the end, I will be saying the name of three three uh, possibilities and then we can figure out which one to read if you have a preference on the title if you don't it doesn't matter I'll just pick one but yeah we'll do that at the end but today I will be reading In the Darkness written by blank published on July 1st 2016 estimated reading time nine minutes the water seemed to breathe that was how Mark thought of it that faint suggestion of air from the depths. Now that the moment had arrived, Mark wasn't sure he wanted to plunge into that still water. He adjusted his headlamp, checked his gear again. Felicity never understood why he had to go creeping into abandoned buildings, why he had to go there and look into the dark, as she put it. Why can't you take pictures of things in the daylight? Hmm? Mon coeur, I have to do it. It's my art, my life. And sometimes, sweet, the dark looks back. It was true, that feeling in utter darkness of a presence, being watched when there was no one. It was his constant desire to capture it, to make the viewer feel it too, that drove him to those places. He had an installation opening in a small gallery tomorrow. It was his Eastern European trip hung up and framed in a quiet black plastic. Felicity wanted to know why he couldn't make art in France, if he insisted on doing it. Truth be told, he hadn't considered France to be that interesting. He'd always lived there, and so, as people do, he stopped really looking at it. But as she talked, he became excited. There was one place he'd heard about, one place he'd always thought he'd like to see. When Charles Garnier built the Paris Opera in 1861, it was discovered that they were digging the extraordinarily deep foundations into an underground lake. After attempts to drain it failed, Garnier instead constructed a huge subterranean cistern to contain it. This, of course, later inspired the famous Phantom of the Opera, but there had always been a mysteriousness associated with the idea of that. While glistening gentlemen and ladies laughed and savoured the music, beneath their feet lay deep and silent water. Proper permits were, of course, out of the question. For one thing, Mark's persona was built in large part on the idea of a man outside the usual bounds of society. No trespassing signs didn't apply to him. Permits were not his style, but mostly because they wouldn't have given him one anyway. Nowadays, the lake was used for training firemen to dive in the dark, and it was never included on tours of the opera. Mark had scoured the internet for information, but he'd actually found very little. So, finally, he'd simply thrown some basic diving gear in a duffel and bribed a shady janitor to let him in after midnight. It was now or never. He breathed deep, preparing himself for the cold that would seep in regardless of his wetsuit. And he took a moment to feel the weight of the massive old place, all those many, many levels piling on top of him, before he put his foot on the top rung of the ladder. Oh, it was cold all right, bone chilling, but the visibility was better than he'd thought. Algae grew across the bottom and sides of the tunnel, giving the water a green cast. The tunnel was about ten feet wide and an indeterminable length, with a curved ceiling coming down to meet the water's surface, the depth about eight feet or so. Mark snapped a few pictures before biting down on his diving regulator, dipping under and swimming further. At the end, the passage branched to right and left though the left-hand way looked like a dead end. Before long, the water deepened, grew murkier. At the same time, the tunnel widened out to become a kind of chamber, ringed with a little dry walkway. Mark heaved himself out to examine the walls. There, sure enough, was graffiti scratched by a long dead builder. Herbert Duguay, 1862. Mark photographed it, and a few other scratches he was able to make out probably worn away by rising water. Back into the murk, through another opening into a central hub of arched niches, the room was apparently vast and pillared. Light from his headlamp barely reached the ceiling and failed entirely to penetrate the further walls. But after swimming all the way around, it became apparent that this was it. There was no outlet. This was a disappointing end to his adventure. According to legend, there were miles of winding passages. He'd expected vaults and caverns at least. This was boring. No wonder they used it for diving exercises. Well, there was no reason he had to dash back to the surface. He might as well examine the walls for more graffiti. 
make the night worthwhile. After a 20 minute search, there was nothing. Not a scratch that looked anything other than natural faults in the stone. He was on the verge of taking what he had and going back when he saw something moving. It was bobbing under the water, disturbed by his swimming. A woman's dress caught on some sort of grate several feet below water level. This was what Mark had hoped for. Something interesting at last. The weight of the waterlogged fabric threatened to drag him under, but, though he struggled, he was able to get a look at it clearly, enough to realize that it wasn't a dress. It was a ballerina's tutu, complete with a beaded bodice. That made sense. The building being an opera house, though how it got down here was a mystery. Must have been recent, or the delicate fabric would have rotted away entirely. The process had already started. He let it drift a little, then got a quick picture. That grate was more intriguing. Rust and algae covered the surface in thick sheets. This was obviously an original installation. Mark suspected one good kick would get him to the other side, but he didn't know where it led. There could be an entire maze through there. Felicity would be screaming if she knew he was contemplating going through. It was reckless. He could get hopelessly lost. But the dark on the other side called to him. He kicked. It was immediately deeper. How he knew wasn't entirely clear, since he hadn't been able to see the bottom for some time. But he knew it all the same. Breaking the surface, Mark realized he had swum into another single chamber. Not a series of tunnels as he had hoped. There was a bright spot, however. The pillared room was considerably smaller, but more carefully constructed. The tops of the columns had been rudimentally carved, even connected up with arches. Swinging round, flashing his light in the darkness, he bumped hard against something in the water. Cursing the rough stone and nursing a scraped hand, he investigated. It appeared to be a column, broken a few inches under the water, and piled haphazardly with heaps of detritus. Branches, scraps of things too moldly to tell what they had been, there was probably some good stuff in there. The makings of a few creepy photographs, at last. Mark clipped his diving regulator to his shoulder for easy access and, gingerly, mindful not to bring the whole thing tumbling down, hoisted himself onto the top. They weren't branches. His first clue was the unnatural whiteness. Second was the skull staring blankly at him out of its cradle of little fish bones and curving vertebrae. They were all bones. Mark froze, unable to decide if there was a reasonable explanation why the bones should be there. Maybe. Maybe this underground lake was connected, somewhere deep, to the extensive catacombs that ran under Paris. Nobody had fully explored them. It was possible heavy rains and flooding could have washed bones down here. They'd piled up in this column because... because it was the only high ground. It wasn't the sturdiest of arguments. But the other explanation was that some person, or animal, had deliberately woven them together. And, as Mark was well aware, he was the only one here. The grate hadn't been opened since the place was built. That was clear. When he'd kicked it, it'd come out of its frame entirely and was now resting on the bottom. And there was no other way out. The tunnel led here, and only here. Swallowing his distaste, Mark began poking around. Most of the bones were fish and rodent. Their skulls made that obvious. Comparatively few were human. There was only one skull, but he noted several long bones that were undoubtedly once legs and arms. Slowly, as he crouched there, he began to see a progression, like a strata on a rock formation. He could trace the age, bones still with flakes of scale or scraps of hair clinging to them, giving way to yellowed, mottled pieces. Then, down under the water, where, lowering himself, he could see. The bones were so old and damaged they'd fused to the stone. That didn't look good for his theory. Another odd thing. The more he looked, the less random the arrangement appeared. In fact, he thought he could see a depression in the center, surrounded by a uniform lip. Like a nest. A soft ripple of water, coupled with a suggestion of something pale at the edge of the light, made him look around. He hadn't noticed how silent it was until that moment. He froze, searching the water. Nothing. He realized suddenly that this room was unknown to anyone but himself. If he went missing, no one would look here. It occurred to Mark that what he'd seen was only one of the white catfish said to live in the underground lake. The staff even claimed to feed them on occasion. He breathed a little easier. This was ridiculous. He returned his attention to the bones. Something was shining deep in the tangle. He'd see if he could get it out, take a picture, and then maybe he, it would be better to leave, get back to the main cistern, if he was going to be so jumpy. Reaching in, elbow deep, Mark fished around, fingers scraping against slime. 
Whatever it was eluded his grasp. He turned his head, trying to avoid smelling any more of the musty, fishy scent than he had to. When he saw it, a white hand, like a pale spider resting on a leg bone. The rest of the body was hidden by the lip of the nest, but it was moving, rising, pulling itself up in one strong, accustomed movement. The creature was sickly pale, a creamy grey colour like the underbelly of a dead fish. Mark could see its ribs pushing against the skin. All its joints unnaturally prominent. It was human-shaped, but grotesque. Webbed fingers, and where legs should have been, a long, supple tail, thick as a man's waist and covered in raspy skin like a shark. But the face, the face was the worst. Hollow cheeks, hairless, a wide, lipless mouth. Too wide, really, for a person. And the eyes, huge and round, ringed in silvery bronze with an enormous black pupil. Fish eyes. It stared at him, motionless. Mark felt like screaming. He felt like running, tearing at the walls, throwing bones at the creature, clawing his way out onto the street. But he knew, in the way a man knows in the presence of a tiger, not to move. Slowly. Millimeter by millimeter, he drew his arm up through the bones, reaching for his camera. If he could distract it, it was hopeless. The distance of dead water between him and the great opening was too large, and even if he made it, what was to prevent the creature following him through? There was no getting out. Mark knew that too. A little piece of his brain broke off and ran, childlike, along a trail of curiosity. What was it? How was it here? Maybe Herbert Duguay knew. Maybe Herbert Duguay was in this pile of bones, right at the bottom. The other part of Mark's brain could only think of one thing, and the thinking of it terrified him. Don't eat me. Please don't eat me. I don't want to be eaten! He said it over and over to himself as he inched towards his camera, a mantra to keep the beast at bay. It would hear him. It would understand. It moved. Mouth open, showing teeth so many, so many jammed together in every which way, White and sharp, they sank into his shoulder, cold fingers digging into his arm. He was dragged across the bones, into the water, and down. Down. The regulator was still clipped to his shoulder. If he could turn his head, his arm was going numb, and he could see the streams of blood from his punctured shoulder and the light from the headlamp. But at least he could breathe. As long as he had air, there was a chance. He'd fight the creature, swim for his life. The water was deeper than he'd thought. The bottom rose to meet them, covered in strange lumps and mounds that revealed themselves to be twisted metal rods too damaged to be recognisable, rotted chests, discarded waste from the opera, above, all carefully piled up and hidden away. Bodies, too, complete this time. Arm and hand bones sprouted from the rock, bed like bleached water lilies, skulls, glued to their spines by all those flesh-eating organisms that spread in the darkness. Mark began to struggle. The thing turned on him. Those eyes, biting and dragging him down, pinning him to the bottom, wedging him under something. He couldn't tell what it was. He started to scream, the water in his diving regulator muffling the sound to barely more than a vibration in his chest. No! No! He thrashed, gashing his free arm on something sharp, blood clouding the water. It was storing him here, down in its cool larder, keeping him fresh, waiting for him to die. Mark knew. He knew his struggle was hopeless, that every gasp drained his air tank, but he no longer had control. The animal part of him desperately craved life. He clawed at the stone and rotted wood, and at his own body, trying to rip himself free. There, at the edge of the light, the creature hovered, arms outstretched, relaxed, the blank fish's eyes watching him with almost human interest. Then it receded, but he could feel it, even as he felt the ache in his lungs telling him his air was running out. Mark stared into the dark that was now so full of something looking back, waiting for him to breathe water. Waiting. To feed. Uh, down here it has credit Rosemary Hammond. That was interesting. Definitely better than last week. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, there were points in that that were genuinely spooky. I don't like deep water. It's, it's very not my favourite. But yeah, that was... In the darkness. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the video, uh, this time I've decided to be a little bit more prepared and get a little bit of audience interaction if you so choose, if you enjoy these, if you made it to the end of the video. So, I have three stories in front of me. 
Um, so I'm going to read out the titles and the estimated reading time, and if one speaks to you, let me know which you'd prefer to hear, and then we can we can read that next week. Very interesting, am I right? Yeah. So first of all, we have The Thing in the Fog. Estimated reading time is only four minutes, so that would be a fairly short one by comparison to the nine, eight minute ones that we've been reading so far. And then we have Roadrunner Energy Drink Study, our bizarre outlier, which has an estimated reading time of seven minutes. And finally, we have My Trip to Canada, estimated reading time, eight minutes. All of these are on creepypasta.com. If you're so inclined and you're properly like wondering, you can look them up. But yeah, let me know if one of those titles seems like fun for next week. Uh, as always, I will have the link to In the Darkness in the uh, description, just in case you want to read it. And thank you for watching. I'll talk to you next week. Don't get lost. Don't lose your way. Live well and wash your hands. Slow on.